Welcome back to another episode of ENF TV. Uh, today we're joined by the brilliant uh, Sally Richards, who is the Managing Director of Raspberry Sky Services. <laughs> Sally, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Absolute pleasure. It's uh, it's brilliant to finally get you on the show. I know that we spoke about it sort of mid last year. Um, so to finally get you on the show is an absolute pleasure for me and I'm very happy to have you on. Um, today, we're actually going to be talking about some stuff that is a little bit off topic to what we usually have on the show, um, which I think people actually be quite surprised at with obviously your background and obviously what your business does um, for, for clients. But as I say, I think we'll, we'll come on to that in just a second. But at the start of the show, we always like to hear about the guest, you know, your background, how you came to discover, I suppose, the hospitality and travel and tourism industry, and what led ultimately to you starting your own business, and, and I suppose what that business actually focuses on. So I suppose, Sally, please do tell us a bit about yourself. Sure, no problem. So I was brought up in Cornwall, um, which is my constant love for being close to the sea. Um, uh, funnily enough, living in the most landlocked county in the UK now, so uh, not quite achieved that, uh, that goal. Uh, <laughs> but I studied uh, travel and tourism um, in Cornwall when I left school. And then my first job was working for a, a TMC in Cornwall. And then I moved with that TMC to um, Oxford, to a large branch and all the excitement that uh, living in Oxford uh, brings before, uh, I guess, the the big lights of London called really. Um, and a friend of mine got a job working at Qantas Airways um, in Chiswick. And she called me and said, oh, look, they're, they're recruiting for other reservation agents. Why don't you apply? So I applied and, and, uh, and got the job and um, worked with Qantas and their tour operating arm um, for three years. Um, and the great thing about that was, because we're going back to sort of the late 80s, early 90s, this was the time when after you've worked for them a year, you could travel the world for free, all your tickets for free. Mm -hmm. So we used to go and have uh, long weekends in Rio, uh, long weekends in Dubai, in the days when there was just one hotel on the beach. It was bright pink called the Chicago Beach Hotel. <laughs> so going back um, some time, um, but great days, great memories. Um, and then we got into hotel, hotels after that. I worked for UTEL um, for a number of years, about 10 years. Um, and in different roles, I guess, sales, marketing, but eventually evolving into sort of commercial roles. Um, and Utah went through a, a, a merger, an acquisition, et cetera. So I spent a couple of years living in the States, uh, which was great, and uh, learning about all the different ways of working. Um, and then eventually came back to the UK as VP Marketing uh, for Utah. And then uh, one reorganization too many. <laughs> There's only so many times you can centralize, decentralize, centralize, decentralize. Um, I truly believe if you if you if you don't believe in uh, the strategy of the organization, then it's your turn to, to, to leave. So I ended up leaving and uh, working for a startup company called Leonardo, um, and working with them as commercial director to set up the or to create the first uh, content switch in the industry. So working with rich content and um, images. Um, and that was a great team. And I, I look back on it fondly for all of the laughter and memories that we had because we used to fly a bit by the seat of our pants. Um, and, uh, but we managed to develop a SaaS based hosted solution, which was the first. And we sold that solution into some of the biggest players in the market today. So into Travelport, Amadeus, Pegasus, Apodo, et cetera. Um, and then they were later acquired by BFM. So after that due diligence process, I just decided to do something for myself. So at the time, co-founded uh, Raspberry Sky, and that was uh, 15 years ago. So, um, yeah, that's a bit of a whirlwind. <laughs> Definitely. And, and obviously, just for the audience, I know that we'll have a lot of people that will know exactly who you are. They'll probably know you or be connected with you and so on. But just for anybody that doesn't know, what is it that Raspberry Sky Services uh, focuses on? So um, I guess because of my background, having worked in both what I call supply and demand. So I've worked on the travel agency um, and channel side, but also on the hotel side and with the technology distribution. Yeah. Um, I guess we, uh, we work with uh, demand generators and hotel anything with a bed or um, anything uh, for a 
component to be sold, actually. Um, and we offer things like, I mean, the, the umbrella terms would be commercial reviews. So sometimes organizations have a point of pain. They may not know why that is. Um, and they ask us to come in to do a review for them. Um, and we will look at system people process. Um, inevitably, that, uh, that underlying element um, it is always identified through that process. So commercial reviews are a big thing. Um, generally, what happens after we've done a review is we'll write a report to say, this is the findings, this is what we think, um, the actions and activities that you uh, need to take. Mm -hmm. um, and in most cases, we will then help that business project manage that in. Uh, we're not one of the agencies that will write a report and, and walk away. We actually roll our sleeves up, get our hands dirty, get under the bonnet and help them with the business, bringing the hearts and minds with them, um, transition their, their business and a, a bit of a change management um, process. Yeah. Part of the thing we do is also system procurement. If people are organizations think, you know, my, my, my technical staff or my PMS or my revenue management system or my CRS is old or is there something better out there? Um, particularly at this time, you know, when we're looking at digital you know, digital journeys and things like that, you know, does, does my technology support my customer journey? Uh, we do a lot of system uh, procurements and things. So um, we have a wide customer base um, and uh, quite often our briefs are quite fluid. You know, there'll be people we know in the industry that will contact us and say, look, we don't think this is working quite right. We're not quite sure what the problem is. Can you help us? So that's the kind of thing we do. Fantastic, fantastic. Again, just more for the benefit of the audience, just to make sure that they're fully aware of what you do um, and obviously what the business does and what it focuses on and so on. Um, okay, so moving on to, I suppose, what obviously we wanted to talk about. And as I said, this episode is gonna go in a very different direction to what we usually do. Now, obviously with regards to the times that we find ourselves in, you know, one of the biggest things, and I've actually had somebody on the show to talk about well-being within businesses and so on. But I think it would be, quite a, a good time to be talking about us personally mm. well-being um our mindset our i suppose general wellness in a lot of ways for from a, a mental health point of view uh, from a physical health point of view um and also obviously that will always trickle down to your professional uh, life of course it will any any sort of anything that's going on in your personal life will always be reflected in your, your business and anything in your business life will most of the time be affected by your personal as well um so I suppose to kick it off, how are you doing? <laughs> well, thank you, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I don't know. Um, I, was, I was reflecting on this after we uh, had our little chat and sort of thinking about, you know, how am I, how am I feeling? I think I'm feeling good at the moment. Um, January, February is not my favourite time of year anyway, I have to say. Yeah. It's a pretty dire, isn't it? The UK, cold, wet, dark. Ugh, everything's finished. Snowing, Wait. for God's sake, there's enough snow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you've got snow. We haven't had snow. <laughs> but, I, but, I, but I think, actually, I guess what I've learned in the last 12 months, and I think, actually, 2020, I think was the hardest I worked um, for very little revenue gain, actually, because of the industry. Um, and I think I exhausted myself. Um, and... And took some time, I guess, to just think about, you know, what's important. And I think it's this, it's the simple things. I mean, isn't it? It's it's family, it's friends, it's community, it's I don't know, it's it's the ability to to share and to help and support others. I mean, you've done that, Tom, in terms of you know your uh, your uh, webinars and your TV um, series. In terms of you know flipping all that on its head and you know, actually, you know, showcasing people who are looking for roles and things. So, I mean, you must think pretty much the same, huh? Yeah, I think um, I think one thing I wanted to agree with you on is I think 2020, again, for, for myself, mm. yeah, I, I don't think I've ever worked as um, hard, but also as, in a lot of ways, as smart. You, you've had to really think on your feet. And it, in, it, in, in my experience, anyway, it, it was very much on a day-by-day -day basis. I was like, okay, how do I how do I challenge myself today? But how do I make something happen? I mean, let's be honest here. You know, I, I yes, my firm works in recruitment, which is already low. But I also work 
focusing on the hospitality industry, which is incredibly low yes. rate. <laughs> and not only that, I also work in a very small niche within that. <laughs> It's your, uh, your funnel. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so the, the sort of focus of the business has, has had to really shift. And as you say, with regards to working hard, yeah, and it's been for relatively a lot lower revenue than it would have been before, um, which has, has been a quite an odd one for any recruitment consultant out there, to be honest, and any business owner. Um so yeah, that one, I definitely agree with you. Um, start of the year is always a difficult one. Um, mm-hmm. It's one of these things where everything was very slow at the start of the year. Well, I, I, I kind of wish it was a little bit slower this year. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, it's generally things start moving very slowly and everyone's a bit sort of lethargic and coming out of the, the Christmas break. Um, and it does seem like a bit of a down sort of period. It's really sort of the end of Q1, start of Q2, where everything starts to pick up. Yeah. Again. You see yeah. me and all the rest of it. Um, and in terms of obviously, I suppose me, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm all right. <laughs> I'm okay. um, I think uh, it, it's one of these things where I'm, I'm naturally a, a positive person anyway. So I, I, yeah. I, I sort of thrive off that. Um, but at the same time, and thank you obviously for mentioning the, the candidate videos, because I think it's one of these things where those were something that for me it was a culture shift and a dynamic Mm. change because it's not in a recruiter's it's not in our very fibers to allow allow i don't even know if that's the right word but enable candidates that are on our books to promote themselves to potential employers because of course it cuts us out (laughs) yeah but i think but i think that's the whole beauty of like you know what what are the positives that have come out of the last 12 months and one thing is is that you know, it's okay to do things differently. Yes. It's okay to try new things. It's yeah. okay to do them and they fail, you know, and they're not successful. They fail. I mean, that's okay too, isn't it? I mean, and if, if, if now it's not the opportunity to tip things on that is head a bit and say, let's try something different, um, you know, then, then when is, do you know what I mean? I think, I think it was one of those, it, I found 2020 to be one of those years where, as you say, you could literally just try anything. It doesn't matter anymore. No, exactly. <laughs> You've got a year of experimentation. Um, <laughs> and if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And as I said, it was very much on a day by day basis. Let's go with this. If it catches on, then great. Um, and I, I, I sort of spoke on a show about that candidate interview stuff. And I said to the presenter of that one, I said, look, it was never about the return on, on the investment side of things because it still cost the business money. Yeah. It was about, it was about the the presence, the credibility, the, the response from the industry from those videos was immense. And, and, that's, that, and that's, quite, that's priceless though, Tom, huh? Yeah, in a lot of ways, yeah. You can't buy that kind of PR, you know, like. And again, it was one of these things that we just fell into it. And I think there was, I think with so many people right now, the one thing that I've, I suppose, caught onto or realized is that the human element of my industry, but I think a lot of industries has been lost massively. Mm. We mm. forget. And, and I think 2020 reminded us all because as you say, family, friends, the things that were important to us were actually just the simple things. Yeah. We are social creatures at the end of the yes. day. Yes. Of interaction. It, it, let me put it for example. I don't know what you, what your thoughts are on this, but I did, I went to, um, a face-to-face conference last year it was a uh, host space yes um, and i sponsored and, and spoke at that but it was the first time in eight months <laughs> that i'd traveled anywhere and that <laughs> i'd seen other people in the professional world and yeah. i honestly I, i'm quite a confident and and sort of you know outgoing person but i walked into that room thinking oh okay there's a lot of people here and there's cameras <laughs> there and i don't know if i could you know and i was very nervous and <laughs> And we're only used to seeing this part up as well. We don't know what you look like from here down, do we? <laughs> and you only get to see this sort of area of, of the sort of thing. Um, and I don't know what your thoughts are, but I don't know, obviously, if you had any face-to-face interactions last year or you're going to be having any, but there was an anxiety there for me anyway. Yeah, no, I'm sure. I'm sure. It's almost like you've forgotten those, you for, you've forgotten how that feels and that, that, those skills. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Of just actually... I guess you didn't, you, there was no contact, was there? So it's kind of, also it's that kind of 
how you deal with that being with people but not actually being able to shake their hand or you know kind of it's, it's kind of being there but not being there as well isn't it it's kind of a bit unknownly I guess massively and and yeah. that brings me on to I suppose the, the the question of people being at home right now so obviously people out there that are either out of work unfortunately or, or furloughed um and there's this constant anxiety about work obviously mm. professional life um but that being compounded with the fact that they are at home you can you can go out very little especially during lockdown periods and i think that well-being piece that sort of keeping yourself engaged and and so on is such an important element because we can't you know life isn't the same and it's you know we're talking about the new normal and all the rest of it but i don't even see that happening for, for anytime soon unfortunately because of this no I, I don't even know I don't even know what that looks like to be perfectly honest anymore so uh I think it's a really good point I think um and I'm by no means a specialist in any of this at all I should precursor this but you know I kind of bumble my way through what I think is good bad and ugly um, and it changes quite frequently as well but um I think if you can get a sort of rhythm in your life and I struggled with this for the last year of taking things up, doing it for a few days or maybe a couple of weeks and then going, oh, it's not for me. And then, you know, um, I think if you can find a rhythm to start your day, um, and I got better at that, I think, towards the end of last year. So I think just taking time to, you know, it, it, as you wake up in the morning when you before you start your mad day, I mean, you know, if you've got animals, children, you know, husbands, wife, you know, it's even more chaotic, isn't it? But I think just taking time to just be, and that could just be just to sit on the side of your bed before you jump into the shower and just sit. Yeah. And it's just, and just try and clear your mind, you know, or, you know, for want of a better term, meditation, which I find really tricky anyway, um, or a bit of yoga, a bit of stretching, and to do something on a regular basis, to find a bit of routine. And it might, might start out being that you sit there for two minutes, the next week might be three, yeah. you know, you might get it up to 10 minutes or something and that's okay. Mm. You know, that's really okay. Yeah. Um, just to sort of get your mind in the right, you know, get, get your thoughts out of your head yeah. before you start your day. And I think little things like that, that are helpful and also take a break in your day. You know, um, I think, you know, nature walk fresh air again even if it's five minutes ten minutes it doesn't matter take the break away from the desk because you know I'm fortunate and you it looks like you are too that you know we have some sort of office space yeah. but you know if you're working off your kitchen table or if you you know and you've got you know kids homeschooling you know just try and if you can take a bit of time I mean I've I appreciate nature more now than I think I ever did. Maybe it's an age thing, I don't know. But I put some um, bird seed out recently, which I haven't done for a while. I feel a bit bad because they've gone mad for the food. So they're obviously really hungry. But we have um, we have a woodpecker that comes and visits. And I am just so delighted when I see him. It makes my it makes my heart feel good. It makes my soul feel good. Do you know what I mean? I kind of think, oh, great, you know, like, a woodpecker, you know, it just seems like a real magical thing. And I think you just appreciate smaller, simple things, don't you? And I think it's about making sure you've got time for those in your day. Listen. You know, even if it's you're in a flat and you've got a window box or a, you know, put a plant in it or just something that makes you just think about nature. I think that really helps. I was going to say, you talk, you talk about plants. There's a bit of a running joke on this channel, to be honest. <laughs> the audience will keep an eye on the types of plants that I've got in the, in the background. And um, on two separate occasions, I've had a plant that's not looked that great. And that <laughs> made it very clear that I should either take care of it or, or replace it. Um, oh, brilliant. Some lovely lilies. Hey, looks like lilies today. I was going to say, somebody commented saying that they were fake one time. And I was like, no, actually, <laughs> not real. Um, but no, I, 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 completely, I completely agree with you in the fact that I found it a lot more beneficial for me to step out of the house. Um, a lot of the times, it, it, and this is me being completely honest, I've had to be pers almost persuaded. You know, I'll be in the midst of something or I'll be in the middle of something. And then like my, my girlfriend would say, look, you know, let's get out of the house. Let's take the dogs for a walk. And I'm like, yeah, I will. I will. 
but I'll, I'll I just need to finish this. The problem is, I find is there's ne- there's always something else. Yeah, yeah. And before I know it, because it, it gets dark so early now as well. Yes. <laughs> I know it, it's dark. It's cold. It's raining, and then all of a sudden the day's gone. Oh, yeah. And I think you're right. Trying to implement these sort of almost practices in the morning, first thing you get up, something that I've tried to do, and I don't know, you might agree with this one, but um, something I, I religiously did every single morning, as soon as I woke up, I grabbed my phone, I check emails and the rest of it. You see, I don't think you should take, I don't take my phone uh, upstairs. My phone never goes in the bedroom, ever. That's what I want to start doing. Because we're not saving lives, Tom. We really are not saving lives. And actually, I first pick that up by the time when I get downstairs. It's in the kitchen. I've had my, you know, morning shower, whatever. I've come down, put the kettle on, and then I pick my phone up. And do you know what? There's no, there's no May Day. No. You know, there's, no, there's no life to save. It's true. <laughs> and do you know what? I think tomorrow, and I mean this, tomorrow I'm going to try it for the first time. I'm going to leave my phone downstairs in the kitchen and I'm going to come down. Like the only time I'm going to look at it is by the time when I come down. Yeah. It's like really hard to not do that because I think I've always had this thing where, you know, now I, now I own my business. I have to be on it all the time. I can't miss anything, but you're right. We're not saving lives. There's nothing that's not. so time urgent that it's not going to wait until eight thirty nine in the morning. It's just. It's exactly. Um, exactly. And I do think, from a and I don't want to dive too much into this but like the main things I jump on are social media you know um uh sort of uh, platforms so your instagrams and mainly linkedin and I'll immediately start scrolling and I I do feel myself sort of going into this um almost zone where I just find hours but you can wait an hour two hours just yeah can't you and it, and it and you got fall into this pit, and I, I think there's so much more positivity that can be taken out of the morning rather than the afternoon. Because, as you say, get up and get out of the house, go for a morning walk with the dogs or the kids or whatever, or get, have that morning routine where you do have a bit of a, a bit of silence and a bit of quiet, whether yeah. it's meditation or, or other terminologies for it. But yeah, I, th- I think you know this, the whole social thing, and we, we know. I mean, we're not. We know. We, we know the pros and cons, and we know why it's good and why it's bad, and when it works and when it doesn't. But I think it's it's habit, and that's the problem, isn't it? And it's trying to change that habit. Have you heard of a guy called Wim Hof? Yes, the oh Ice God. Man. I I've watched um I watched a episode of Russell Brand's. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. And oh my, I was I watched the whole thing from start to finish. It was absolutely brilliant, and I love him to be honest. He is, you know, he's absolutely great and free. Uh, so something good for social media. So for free, you can download the Wim Hof uh, breathing um, uh, uh, sessions that he does. Yeah. And he's such a Viking, isn't he? He's yeah. like, yeah, I feel it and it's all okay. And it's this kind of like resounding deep, you know, sort of like Scandi kind of voice. Um, and there's a little group I have, and we once a week um, at about nine o'clock at night. Um, we all meet in our virtual area, you know, group in, in whatever houses you're in on WhatsApp. Mm-hmm. And we do the Wim Hof and we do Wim Hof breathing. We do the four session, the four different breathing things. And, and I love him actually. And I don't do it every week. And sometimes I don't do it at that time. I do it later. I'll do it another day. Um, but the, the deep breathing, the holding of the breath and, you know, the cold showers, you know, like, I love it. I think it's great. As a result of that, uh, at the end of a hot shower, I'll always crank it. Cold. Crank it cold. Bang. And it's just like this sudden burst. And I'm like, <gasps> <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been able to have just a whole cold shower. But yeah, that last sort of 20 second absolute freezing. Yeah. Break. Yeah, and it, and it does. It does do that. I mean, you know, when I do the, I do, I do the same, I do. I try to do like a warm shower and then I go down to uh, zero and I can last about a minute now. Um, but I don't put my head right under. I've done that a few times. It's so painful. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like, it's really bad, doesn't it? It's yes, right in front of your yes, head. Yes, yes, yes. But actually, when I when I do do it and I get out the shower, I do feel more exhilarated. I do feel more awake. I feel more right and ready for my day. And you know, 
Yeah. You're doing what he does, where he basically jumps into a freezing cold lake, free, like completely naked or whatever. Um, so, you know. I know. But there's so many people now, do you see it? I mean, um, doing, uh, you know, um, swims, lake swims, swimming in the sea in the in the winter I, again I don't it's just I'm getting older my friends are getting older but <laughs> they seem to want to do that a lot um I quite fancy that I quite fancy doing that do it let me know how you get on because somebody else has actually been talking to me about trying it out and I'm like no my first response was no <laughs> um but uh, you know. I can imagine you doing that I think that would be super cool up in Derby there must be some big lake things aren't there Oh my god, yeah. I mean, we've we've yeah. got some beautiful we've got some beautiful places around here, but I'm just kind of like that sounds like hell to me. But I, I'm one of these people that I will give it a go. But again, I'll have to be dragged. I'll I'll have to be persuaded and dragged and all the rest of it. And a lot of the time, I'm sort of enjoying it while I'm in it. But then if I try and come back to doing it again, I'm like, no. Yeah, no, you remember it. It's like a bad. <laughs> it's like going to the dentist. I don't want to do that again. <laughs> this is it. This is it. And I suppose that that. Almost, I, I suppose, in a way, it does bring me on to my sort of next question, which is related to well-being, because I know how it's made me feel, and I know obviously how it's made you feel when you've done it as well. And it's this element of self gratification from giving back. Yeah. Now, a lot of people during the pandemic that have, have been talking to me anyway on my episodes and things, if they have been on um, furlough and things, they've been volunteering. Uh, they've been doing things uh, for food banks and, and all this sort of stuff. And it's been brilliant to hear. But one of the things that you and I have got actually in common is, is actually going back uh, to universities and guest lecturing. Um, and there's something that obviously we find quite um, fulfilling in that. And obviously we, we, we spoke about going back to our schools, going back, I know. You know, going back to our secondary schools and, and having an opportunity to talk to the young people that were in sort of our positions way back when um and i suppose my sort of question to you is how first off did you come up or go about lecturing in, in university or get guest lecturing in universities um and how did that make you feel initially well i first had the opportunity actually with um uh i'm gonna get this right snapshot um with Janelle and uh, a guy who's no skates me and he'll kill me for that. Um, anyway, uh, at EHL in Lucerne, and they asked me if I would go and uh, lecture on their distribution revenue module. Yes. Um, and it was an all day, all day lecture. Um, and it was based on their slides. I'll never forget it. And I was just like, oh my God, yes, no, yeah, yeah, I'll do it. I thought, God, you know. Surely it's going to be okay. It was okay. And um, what, I, what I really loved about it was you're sitting in front of a group of early 20-year-old uh, ladies and gentlemen who are embarking on, you know, the industry. And you're trying to explain distribution and what happens. And, you know, and they're kind of like looking at you like you're some alien life form as to why, why, why would that be how it, why would it work that way? Why wouldn't you do X, Y, Z? And you go, yeah, I, yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> we have made our industry really complicated and it's based on legacy and, you know, but what I find quite inspiring is there's just, there's just, you know, new life, new blood there, new ways of thinking. And, you know, gosh, um, there's a lot of bright people out there who I really, really hope do really come into the industry and, um, you know, take it by the scruff of its neck and drag it into something which, you know, will uh, really, truly be next generation. Because I think we need those new brains, new minds coming forward that think differently um, and approach the industry differently. So EHL is a great one. I've done a bit of London Partners. In fact, I got an email today from The Hague uh, for a student who's writing a report and wants a bit of help on AI and digital maturity and stuff. And it's like, yeah, great. You know, love to do that. Love to do that sort of stuff. But I also have a 17-year-old son who's just in A-level mode. Right. And so many of his friends are so super stressed by exams. And, and I kind of kind of want to say, I know it's important, but equally, it's, it's not life and death. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's not trying to, trying to get them to get their head around. It's about their personality. It's about them as an individual. It's about, you know, there's, 
there's more to it than an exam grade on a paper piece of paper mm-hmm. and that's what we spoke about you know wouldn't it be great to go back to school you know give them our wisdom <laughs> tell them that you know it's not life and death you know there's there's more to life there's more facets to life and business this is it and i it, it was something that um i first off I, sorry first off yeah I, that's that, that's very similar to myself is i i fell into guest lecturing at um uh, Glion, uh through a good friend of mine michael haywood i know you know as well oh yes yeah um and michael basically approached me uh three or four years ago and um he sort of said look you know i, I think it'd be really good for somebody who's connected in the industry, but not just from an employment point of view, as in sort of a, an employer, uh, but somebody who sort of is involved in lots of different places and understands how it all works. So I was like, oh, okay, um, I really don't know about <laughs> I said, um, I'll give it a go. But again, sitting in, in a room full of students that are brilliant in so many ways, and I'm there <laughs> sort of going, hi guys. <laughs> um, <laughs> And it was it was actually incredibly intimidating, but they were so kind. Um, and as you say, they are they are brimming with brilliant ideas and and passion mm-hmm. and enthusiasm. You know all the things that we lost over the, over the years. <laughs> <laughs> you old cynic, you. <laughs> oh, God. I thought oh, I hate all of you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Not cool. Um, then obviously it rippled into working with a number of other universities, Oxford Brooks and um, yes. of Essex, the, the hotel school there, Edge, which is amazing. Um, and it all sort of it became this sort of regular thing. I'm, you know, with Glion especially, we've got such a great relationship and I'm there a, a few times a year now as part of a marked course, which I'm thrilled to be a part of. But you're right, there are so many incredible um young future commercial leaders that mm. are in these institutions and they just need that opportunity and I, I've been a huge advocate through many different platforms and, and my own to get these guys straight into to jobs um, yeah. not and don't get me wrong internships and graduate schemes are great and they do their job but I've always been focused on getting them straight into what well, from my perspective anyway straight into a revenue management job full yeah. time you know, with real career prospects within that. And it's been great. We've, we've had some great success with that. But we're already seeing these incredible people implementing new ideas, pushing things forward, knocking on their manager's doors, asking for more projects and different things that they can do. Yeah, it's great though, isn't it? I mean, oh. it's great that you in your role as well, you know, can, can be the conduit that brings the two elements together. You know, identify that talent and the best cultural fit from an organisation perspective that's open to, you know, bringing young people in with very little work experience, but with a real, you know, great mind and energy, you know? It come, it, you know what? It comes down to um, the clients. I mean, obviously, I, yeah, I'm, I'm very proud of that fact and, and we're, we're continuing to do it. But the, the clients that took a punt, so... Um, the first one that ever took a graduate with no experience at all into a revenue management job through me was um, uh, Neetu when she worked at RBH. I don't know if you know Neetu, but Neetu is the head of revenue at, uh, at RBH. And she took a punt. She just sort of said, you know what? Yeah. Why I not? This. I believe that this is the right way to go. And I believe that this is what our industry need to do. And it was a, it was a huge success. They, they got, came on board. And it, and it was almost like, these other clients and competitors and all the rest of it heard about this and then they jumped on it and then we had Accor and Marriott and the big boys taking students on and now it's just a conveyor belt you know every year we have two graduations and every year we have some fantastic students and I'm yeah it's one of these things that it's something that as a culture within our industry we have to be focusing more on if I'm honest yeah but that, yeah. actually, you touched on it a moment ago, actually, getting, going back to your school. School. I thought yeah. me and you are definitely on the same page on this because I would love, and you said about departing wisdom. Uh, <laughs> I don't know like, how to go far old, to say that. <laughs> but, old crony coming in to say how it used to be in my day. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how lucky you are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It might, it used to make us cross that bridge in the rain. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I... I kind of, I kind of, 
it'd be so cool, wouldn't it, for schools to do more of that? I mean, I have I have been to um I went to school, I think it was last year, it must be the year before, uh, to chat to an A-level group. Uh they'd had a question that was travel hospitality and um they contacted me and said oh you know would you come in for a chat and I was like oh god this is like going into a classroom full of my sons and like this is just not going to be great um but it was really rewarding actually and I think I think if there was more of that going on like you know you don't, you don't have to it doesn't have to be your school but it would kind of kind of would be nice to go back to your school I mean mine's in Cornwall but I mean it would be nice to go and go I've been here I've been there this you know I, I get I get this. And also, I think if you go back to your own school, you kind of understand, kind of understand that, that, that town, yeah. that what it's like to grow up there, you know, where, where I grew up, it was very, um, in, you know, gosh, we still had, you know, mining back then. And, you know, um, tourism wasn't, it was on the cusp, really, you know, well, you know, used to, I used to work in a sweet shop on a, Saturday, Sunday, and serving ice creams, and we all had jobs in the pub when we were a bit older and stuff like that. But out came the Cornish twang then, don't know if you know that. But, um, <laughs> but I think if you went back to your own one, you'd understand what that what that little market, that little sort of microcosm of society is like. You know, I think it would be cool, wouldn't it? Well, no, this is it. And I, well, what I, would you tell them, though, Tom? What would you say? Oh, no. What would your wisdom be? What would I say? Um, do you know what I'd say? No matter how, this is obviously coming from very personal, and I don't want to go too deep into it, but just no matter how difficult things seem, it will never, it will never be as bad as you think it will be. Mm -hmm. And you know, life will be what you make of it. I think that's that's the, and that's just from my personal experience and, and obviously yeah. my experience. But I suppose that's where that's the route I'd probably go down is you're all amazing and you'll realize your why you're amazing and and sort of find your feet but yeah what no matter how dark things seem they'll never be as bad as you think they will be and i think i think life some, it always will throw you a curveball you know yeah. and it's kind of how you deal with that and you know however as you say however bad you think it is at the time you know there is light mm. it will you know you you do you do come out of that and uh Hold on, I'm not getting out of this. What, what would you tell them? I would say uh, don't lose your spirit. Don't lose your personality. Yeah. Be who you are. Be true to yourself. You know, because however off the wall or naughty or devious or, you know, like there's a place for everyone, I mm. think. You know, there's, 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 there's something for everyone. And I remember years and years ago uh, working for a lady uh, called Trish Warwick. And um, when I went to Utah, and I was a bit sort of, um, I know you find this hard to believe, Tom, I was a bit gobby. I was a bit, <laughs> but everything was really important and passionate about everything. Yeah. And I remember having a bollocking one time and uh, by her boss. And then she called me in for a meeting and I thought, oh, this is curtains. This, this you know, I've, I've overstepped the mark. And she called me in and we had a chat. And then she said, Sally, don't ever lose your spirit. Don't change your personality. You are who you are. And, you know, you'll, you'll find your place. And so I don't have to have my own company. But <laughs> unemployable. No. But, <laughs> you know, you will, you will find your thing. You know, you will find your thing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you go, you'll twist. It's a bit like, you know, it's just, you just, you don't you don't move in a straight line, do you, in your life? You know, things happen and you take a left or a right or you know, and and as Wim Hoff would say, it's okay. Yeah, yeah, that is that yeah. Absolutely brilliant. Yeah, definitely. You Isn't would. it? I mean it's weird as well. If if I think about it, if I hear what we if I listen to what we've just said, to what we'd say to young people in the schools that we're in, I would arguably say that to anybody in their profession well, in their lives, right? Yes. Older no matter what age they are, actually, because I think we are in danger of, and I lost myself at one point, um, uh, you know, a fair few years ago now, but I, I became something I, I wasn't. And I think as adults, as we become adults, our imagination and our creativity and everything else almost just gets, you know, squeezed out of us. Yeah. And we become, you know, almost institutionalized. It all starts with exams and, you know, 
morning routines at school and doing what you're told and sitting at the tables and it's sort of stepping away and breaking that institutionalization and, and becoming who you are again. I, yeah. I had very much a, a, a period of time where it was a self-discovery piece, I gotta say. Yeah, and I, and I think, I think if we're all truthful, I think we've, we've, we all go through that at different stages in our lives. Do you know what I mean? And you kind of, and I think literally the last 12 months has made a lot of people have that, have that time to think earlier in their life, perhaps than, than later, you know, um, in terms of what's important and, you know, where they want to be and, you know, and all the very successful kind of, you know, um, people in business, they all say it's okay to fail. Yeah. yeah, it's okay for things to go wrong and and then you know and you just change it and, and, and move on, yeah. you know. But I've got a question for you, Tom. How important is music in your life? Because I can see a saxophone back there. <laughs> I, I, I won't ask you to play it, obviously. Oh God, but... Thank God for that. Thank God for that. <laughs> so that saxophone, a lot of people ask about the saxophone. A lot like cool. a um, and it's actually my, my girlfriend's mum who, who she who used to play. Um, but I suppose music is still is, has always actually played quite a big part of my life. Um, I learned uh, the bass guitar and I played bass in a, in a band um, when I was a lot younger. Um, I was in the band for a, a few years. Um, but that was actually as a result. So I've actually grown up with music to be quite honest with you. My, my dad was a bassist in a band in the 60s. Oh, cool. Yeah, and he traveled Europe. He traveled in the back of this van and uh, he, was, he used to tell me about the stories of him and my uncle Michael. So my uncle Michael was uh, the, the keyboardist or, or whatever and my dad was the bassist and all of them were my uncles. I'd always sort of see them as an uncle. Um, um, when obviously I was, I was born and I, and I sort of met them and whatever. And um, he used to tell me all the incredible days of when he used to play bass. And um, it was one of these things where, and I've still got photos. Have I got any up here? No, I don't. Oh, that's annoying. So I've got these photos of him doing these promo things with all these cravats and these <laughs> jeans and everything else. And it, it's, it was incredible. And um, seeing the pictures of them on the road in the back of this van. Oh, how cool. I, I used to think, oh, I'd, I'd love, I'd love, love, love that. So I, came, I got into a band and, Ever since then, really, music's always been a, a big part of my life. So, yeah, the saxophone, <laughs> slightly not to do with me, but music still is certainly something yeah. big to me. I mean, I think there's there's a little bit of uh, a, a question there behind you. The fact that you've asked me that question, why? Go on, tell me, um, you know, what... Yeah, well, I can't confess I'm a singer or I play any instruments or anything like that, but I, I've always loved music. I was laughing with you, with your, uh, you know, your dad driving the band. My first boyfriend had a band and I used to be the roadie right. and drive the van, obviously, because they were too drunk, having had played a set late at night in some, you know, uh, pub or nightclub or something like that. And uh, I have very fond memories of that and quite an eclectic, I guess, uh music that I like you know um yeah. I still love all the oldie stuff you know um but I was at the weekend actually I was I had one of your social media moments because my husband was watching Manchester United versus Liverpool okay. so I was upstairs and I took the iPad up and I was um looking at music videos and Paul Weller I mean what a man what a dude you know and listening to some of that stuff and just and I think the great thing with music, it just takes you back to a point in time in your life when, you know, I remember you too. I remember being sort of 18 and uh, uh, Under a Blood Red Sky came out and playing it so loud on a Friday night, you know, driving up to a nightclub or something like that, you know, and uh, just just great memories. I think that's the, that's the thing, isn't it? So, yeah, I love live music. Absolutely adore live music. I think that's one of the beautiful things, actually, about music is... Um... I, so a lot of people, so again, like you, I have a very eclectic taste in, in music. I, the band I was in was very, very heavy metal. Um, oh, cool. Yeah, so that was very heavy, but. Um, I'm, a, I'm a Foo Fighter fan. Oh, there you go. Foo Fighters, love them. Absolutely brilliant. So, so we've got that, but I've been to concerts. I saw, I had the absolute pleasure of seeing Earth, Wind and Fire live. Oh, amazing. That to me was incredible. Um, and then this is a really sort of more oldie one, but Christopher Cross. Oh my God, now you're going back. That's before my time. So, <laughs> so 
my dad, when he used to drive up and down uh, the UK, we'd, we'd always listen to Christopher Cross. Um, and it, it, there's something in it that just gives you, for me anyway, just gives you goosebumps. Mm -hmm. I remember the long car rides and stuff like that. And we saw him in the Royal Albert Hall, uh, not last year, the year before. And um, it was incredible. And there was obviously a, a generation difference. And I had a woman actually come up to me with my parents and everything else, because I, I came down for it. And um, she said, do you even know who this guy is? And I, was oh, like, really? <laughs> I said, um, believe it or not, yeah, I, I do. And, and she saw me singing along and everything else. And um, I was like, yeah, I do. This is part of my childhood. That this, was, this was my this was my soundtrack um, yeah. and my dad was sort of talking to her in, in the end, but it's one of those things where music isn't, isn't generational at all. No, no. Mm. Although some of the music my son listens to, I think is quite generational. <laughs> 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 not, I've not quite got into the rap stuff, I have to right. say, but, um, <laughs> but equally, equally, so a funny, funny story is that, I've always, always, always been a Kate Bush fan. You know, my first mm -hmm. album I ever bought was Lionheart. I'm a real Kate Bush fan. And um, I'd always said, if ever she tours, you know, I'm there, I'm there. And it's got several years ago, she did her tour. Right. And everyone I'd ever spoken to was like, oh, she's dreadful. Oh, I don't like, her. you know, I've never met a Kate Bush fan. So when her tickets went on sale, I thought this is going to be dead easy because I'm going to be the only one in the world that wants to get a ticket. And I couldn't get tickets. And I was absolutely devastated. So I ended up having to buy one on the black market and going there. And it was all, oh, it was all sort of like, um, you had to show your passport, you had to match it. I was like, oh, this is a nightmare. Anyway, I got in and it was like, I almost like cried the whole way through it because I just could not believe that I was, you know, one of the such fortunate ones that got to see her in Hammersmith awesome. on her tour. I mean, it was amazing. The Apollo, by the way. Yes. Uh, the Apollo, I yeah. love it. The venue at the Apollo is incredible. Yeah. But so no. the other thing I think is really important, right, as well as um, music, is laughter. So what makes you laugh? Mm -hmm. And I'll help you with this because I found something last week that made me laugh so much. I It was so good for the soul. I thought, you know, I'm going to watch this every week. There was a thing on Facebook. Yeah. It was from 1987. And it was the BBC following a group of adults on their first ski trip. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Have you ever been skiing? Yes. <laughs> okay. I'm going to send you. I'm going to send. I'm going to send you. I'm going to send you the link because if you don't absolutely roar with laughter, I will be amazed. Honestly, it is the funniest thing I have seen. A because they've got no ski gear on anyway in 1987, and the poor guy Kevin and his friend who get off the. Uh, the uh, the button lift too soon you know that rolling back taking everyone out as you go back kind of thing it was brilliant yeah. and i think you know if you can laugh every day at something then yeah. i i do you know what a lot probably makes me laugh to because again i am a very positive person but i am a uh, a dark comedy type person i i love sort of sort of testing that sort of borderline type stuff there's there's a movie that i absolutely adore um and it is a comedy but it touches on so many difficult and dark things it's, it's called the death of stalin i don't know if you've ever oh no i haven't seen it oh my god it's a brilliant political satire film and it, it, it's basically as if um stalin oh. basically has a heart attack in his office and there's all of his entourage and all of his sort of ministers and everything else all basically club around and like is he actually dead? Because obviously they would never <laughs> admit that he was dead. They just couldn't because he was like a god. Uh, it was the most incredible film. And that is one that absolutely gets me every time. So if you love... Oh, no, I have to look out for that. Honestly, check it out. It's absolutely incredible. Um, but yeah, a really good movie, a really good comedy movie will always get me. I love the oldies, like uh, Norman Wisdom. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I've sort of this box set with about nine films in it. And all with Norm Wisdom is incredible. Um, dog videos will always get me. Dog videos. <laughs> like, Just I be careful scroll, about that. <laughs> I could scroll through uh, Instagram or whatever just looking at dog videos. In fact, I have done it, if I'm honest. So uh, shoot me. <laughs> um, there's me being completely honest and transparent. Um, but yeah, just just stupid stuff. And and again. My, my girlfriend and I, we, you know, if, if something going on in the house or, you know, I'll always, 
she knows when I'm joking, but I always pick her <laughs> <laughs> throughout the day. And there's always this look that I'll get, and it's and it just it cracks me up because then she'll cotton on, and I'm like, oh crap. Um, oh, brilliant. Yeah. So I do. I I, I completely agree with you. Actually, I, I didn't tell her that, but laughter. Laughter is actually a really, really important one. A really, a much more important one than I actually gave it credit for. Yeah, I think so. And I think when I when I saw this video the other week, uh, last week, and I just I laughed, and then I shared it, and so many people were kind of like, "Oh my!" And like, it's made me laugh so much. I thought, "Oh, do you know? We just need more of that, don't we?" Yeah, I, I do agree, and 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 for it to be genuine as well, just that that's and again, I, I come back to the first point, but I it's just bringing that human element back and that yeah. it back and that you know communication whether it be through digital means or whatever but just that that sort of the very thought of you sending a video to somebody to make them laugh yes it's okay yeah. It's yeah. but it's the thought process behind it i know that this is going to make somebody laugh so i'm going to send it to them that's yeah. a beautiful thing in itself i'm right? going to send you the link to the i'm going to send you the link to the skiing video so you i'll, can I'll send you a link to, a, to where you can watch death of starling yes that's a deal. That's a deal. Absolute deal. I suppose let's let's end. Unfortunately, let's end the video, but let's end it on a really good note. I suppose. What? Let me have a think. What? No, I don't even want to go down the advice route. What would you say to people right now um, that are out there that are feeling, you know, a bit tired with everything and a, and a bit sort of overwhelmed by stuff? What would you say to them at the moment? to give them a bit of a positivity kick for the week ahead? I think reach out to a friend. Don't, don't do it alone. You know, there, is, there are people there to help um, and friends and colleagues that you can reach out to. I think everybody has so much uh, a better appreciation of yep. what people are going through now than ever before. And I think people have time uh, yep. to give, to, to, to help. So I think... If you're having a rough time, if you're having a bit of a bit of doubts, I think reach out, reach out to, to friends and colleagues um, for help and support. Um, yeah. For definitely, don't don't suffer alone. No, talk to somebody. I mm. don't agree with that one. Um, How about you? What advice would you give? It's a good one. I think you know. So many times, it's always about stay positive, keep your chin up, and all the rest of it. So um, easy to say the words, isn't it? But not actually feel it. I think that's the thing. And I, I do like your reach out one. I think my one mm. would probably be something along the lines of the simple things, you know, reconnect oh. the things that you really love. And it doesn't always have to just be sitting on the couch watching a movie, unless that's obviously something that you're passionate about. But, you know, cook, you know, create something at home. Maybe even, you know, something that we started doing was baking, not because, oh, we want to bake, but because it was something that we could do together. Yes. Um, yes. Even if it's not connecting with other people, I, I have a very bad habit of keeping things to myself. And it's something I'm trying to work on personally. Um, but be open with people about mm. what you're going through. Obviously, you said about connecting with people. And I think there's very similar stuff in there. But even if it is just going for a walk with yes. a significant other um, or baking or, or doing something, get creative with whatever it is that you've got going on. Because now is the time, I mean, the, the worst way possible. We've got a bit more time on our hands for all the better or worse reasons we have. And find the opportunities to find positivity in that. Yeah. As and do a bit of Wim Hof. Do it. Oh, my God. Check out Wim Hof. In fact, <laughs> I'm going to put the link in. <laughs> link in below because I think that's such a good one. So I'm actually going to put a link in below for that. Yeah. Um, so yeah. What I'd say is. I think so. Thank you, Sally, for, for joining me today. It's actually been so lovely. I, this has actually made my week. What, we're on a Tuesday today, and I, I, I feel, no, we're not. What a Monday. Only Monday. Monday. I'm feeling really good. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm so glad you were open to doing a different format and something interactive, because I think we've all learned a bit about you as well, which is great. And I hope, if nothing else, it's given people a bit of a laugh. Yeah. A bit of light relief. <laughs> <I hope so. laughs> Maybe they watched the whole hour. Oh, my God. <laughs> If, if they do, if anybody is watching up until this point, comment below because I'd love yeah, to. Yeah, comment below. Yeah, yeah. yeah, the code word is Icarus. You have to put that in, otherwise, you know you've not listened. <laughs> or saxophone. Yes, then we'll know. Then we'll know. Yeah, exactly that. 
Oh, uh, pleasure. It's been an absolute pleasure, Tom. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for doing this. I really do appreciate it. And um, guys, if you are sticking with us up until this point, <laughs> thank you so much for, for sticking with us. We hope that obviously you enjoyed the episode. Uh, make sure you check out the link below for Wim Hof. Um, I'll also be tagging Sally uh, below as well, so you can check out her profile. Um, yeah. But again, oh, one thing I would mention as well, you've actually done your own online show. So something to obviously um, maybe for us to tag. I don't know. Would you like us to do that? Uh, no, don't worry. It's in the profile. It's the Straight Talking series on the website, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> well, the Straight Talking series is on Sally's uh, internet. <laughs> um, and thank you so much for tuning into this week's episode, guys. Don't forget to see who's on next week's episode now.